G'day and welcome back to RC Model Reviews. Today, by popular request, it's the FSI 6. This is the FlySky 6 channel radio. A lot of people have asked me to review this. Haven't reviewed it to date because I didn't have one, but thanks to Chris, who's iForce2D, that's his YouTube channel, he lent me this one to review. And as usual, of course, it uh, comes in a box, but we don't do unboxing, so there it is. Look at that. Uh, let's have a bit of a look around this thing. Uh, it's obviously, it looks like a radio control transmitter. No rubber ducky antenna, just this little stub here, which is more than enough. It has uh, the usual sticks. They feel, yeah, okay. Now, this is, I think, is a $45 radio. Got to bear that in mind. This looks a bit cheesy, this big fly sky here, but hey, you know. Um, the one thing I noticed immediately is how thin this radio is. Look at that. Look how thin it is. I'll see if I can find another radio here. I very rarely have radios in this place, but here we go. Look, that's a high tech Aurora 9. Yeah, it, it, actually, it's thicker than you would, uh, thinner than it looks. Um, here is the 89 from Radio Link. As you can see, there is quite a bit of difference in the thickness of these radios. Let me go down a little bit so you can see the bottom. This is a really, really thin radio, the Flysky. So, hmm, if it makes it feel a little bit toy-like when you hold it, I have to say. But, hey, you know, let's have a look in the back, see what we have for battery. Ooh, a four-cell uh, AA holder. Not a great fan of those, not at all. It doesn't look like there's any way to actually replace that with a proper battery either. Like when I say proper, I mean rechargeable lithium ion. So you could use NIMH cells in there if you had to, but I'm just not a fan of those crappy AA holders, whatever form they take. So, well, we've got some clicky trims. They feel, yeah, they feel like a $45 radio's trims. Some switches. The switches actually aren't too bad. Better than the radio link switches, which were quite wobbly in the middle. So let's have a let's go tour of the switches. We've got a two position, another two position, a three, and another two. So there's only one three position switch if that's going to be a problem. We've got knobs, and there's no mechanical detent on these knobs, so you won't know when they're in the center position by feel. Uh, there are no sliders. It's a big down for me because I just love sliders. They're so much more convenient than switches for a lot of applications. Now down here we've got a set of buttons. We've got some up, down, what's that one say? OK, cancel, the power switch, and there is a bind slash range test button. This never worked in the 9X for a range test. I don't know if it works in the Fly Sky. Maybe we'll find out. But there you go. That's the radio. A quick look at it. Um, Let's have a look inside. That's where the real important goodies live, isn't it? So, you know, let's take it apart. And this is what it looks like with the back off. And there's some interesting stuff in here, some unusual stuff that I didn't expect to see. Now, if we go down here, we've got our little uh, 2.4 gigahertz module down here. This little tin can has all the 2.4 gigahertz goodness in it. Notice there are two antenna connectors here, micro FL connectors here, which go up. One goes to a vertically polarized antenna up here. Let me move this into shot. The other one goes to, up here, a horizontally polarized antenna. So hmm, it looks like they are using horizontal and vertical, but I don't know because it gets quite complex. If you just transmit the same signal from two antennas, you end up with some horrible phase problems sometimes. So I'm wondering whether they might use one for the telemetry backlink and one for the transmit link. I don't know. This is actually going to be quite interesting. I'll find out when I put the spectrum analyzer on, but suffice to say that's uh, one of the few times I've seen antenna diversity on the transmitter, which is kind of cool. Now, the board looks reasonably good. One thing I wasn't impressed with, though, is there's some solder splatter on this board. I'll show you what I mean. Let's get the macro lens out. Now, down here, you'll see where my screwdriver is. Look at the splatters of solder here. This is, that's not really very good. That's not impressive. Uh, it's probably because this little module has been soldered on by hand afterwards, and they've done a really piss poor job of it. So, mm, I, if it was mine, I would clean that solder off, just make sure, because Unfortunately, those little bits of solder can actually come loose. They're just sitting on top of the resist, and they can actually float around. If you look at the very, very close spacings between the pins on these ICs, for example, they can short those out, and that can cause intermittent problems, and maybe even complete circuit failure if it shorts out the wrong piece. So, yeah, not so flash, but there you go. There are those two micro FL connectors I talked about. They go off to those antennas. Everything else looks pretty sweet, actually. I don't see anything to complain about. And, uh, yeah, there's not... There's not much, which is good. I do love the elegant simplicity of the Fly Sky systems. Right from the original 9X, these things have been so super elegantly simple. I just love the fact that they've squeezed so much out of so little.
Now, I don't immediately recognize the processor chip they're using, and my internet doesn't arrive until later in the week at the workshop here, so if I can find what that is, I shall stick it on the video here as an overlay. But uh, they were using the Atmel processors for these things, for the 9X, and I wouldn't think they would really want to move away from that because they've got a good code base they can use to base their new products on. So let's have a look at how well the soldering's done on the pots and the switches. And this is pretty good. They've used a little daughter board, a little mini board there to connect to the pot. Now the pot lives down in here, underneath there. You can see the shaft of the pot there, which will move when I move the stick. If I can find the stick, where is it? Oh, there it is. See the stick moves. And that goes into the shaft. Now there's a bit of flex on those wires there. Mm, hopefully that won't cause an issue. But see how the each of the pots has its own little daughter board, which relieves the stress completely from the pot wires themselves. That's brilliant. That's that's a really good move. Much better than the radio link setup. And if we go over to the pots here, well, that's soldered. And if I can get the camera to focus, which it probably won't, or maybe too close. Um, try and get it focused from this direction. No, oh, come on, there you go. The soldering is, yeah, it's all right. Uh, there's no strain relief on those though. Uh, and these are PVC wires, so they're quite stiff. And again, no, no heat shrink, no hot snot, so that could be better. I mean, these are small things, but it really doesn't take much over time for these wires to fret and fray and to break off. So yeah, if you get one of these, you might want to just reinforce that. Even a bit of hot glue is better than nothing on those. But um, overall, yeah, I'm not unimpressed. I mean, it is a $45 radio. It's half the price, that radio link. So, you know, this is probably what you'd expect. And yeah, not much else really. I mean, yeah, it's not a bad looking bit of kit. Except for that horrible solder splatter. In fact, just down in there, that looks really bad. <laughs> now one thing I don't see on this radio is any kind of USB connection for upgrading the firmware. And all I can see on the back is a trainer port for your buddy boxing. There may be a data link in there. Of course you don't get a manual, a printed manual with these things. And I'd have to go online and have a look. So I may check the description for extra notes on this review. As I say, my internet doesn't come until next, or well, a few days time so I can't really look this stuff up while I'm here but yep there's uh, obviously but I mean $45 radio <laughs> will you ever upgrade it I understand though there is some open source software or some independent software that's been developed for these which adds a lot of functionality increases the number of channels and does some really cool stuff so if you like hacking about with stuff this could be a reasonably good option because you'll be able to reflash internally using the in circuit serial program and other bits and pieces and uh, who knows what you could turn it into just like the original Flysky 9x became a really good product with the OpenTX software or the ER9X or whatever they used in it. You can do the same sort of thing with this from what I gather. But anyway, that's an aside. And here's the menus just for those that want to know about it. There we go. That's pretty familiar, isn't it? If you're a 9X user, a Flysky or Turnergy 9X user, this is a very familiar menu. So if we go down and into the model setting menu, well, look, it's all pretty simple. Reverse endpoints, display, auxiliary channel, sub trim, dual rate expo, throttle curve, mix, Elevon, VTAL, switches assigned. Eh. It's, I don't think you'd get too lost in there, even without a manual. I think if, you, if you've got half a clue, you could use this without any problems. And here's a receiver that comes with this product. It is a six-channel receiver, because the six-channel transmitter has two sleeve dipole antennas for diversity. I mean, yeah, I don't know. Um, no one else apart, well, I like Free Sky and Futaba. They don't need sleeve dipoles. So, I, you know, I've got to wonder why these manufacturers go to sleeve dipoles, because they are bulky and they can be difficult to mount, but... Ah, you know, it does improve the range and the consistency of the coverage, so that's probably why these things have a pretty good range from what I've been told. I know that uh, Chris says he's got over two kilometres or something, 2.6 or something with this, with one exactly like this. So that's not bad. I mean, the Free Sky will give you probably about the same with the D-series receivers, and so, yeah, but they don't use these sleeve dipoles. Anyway, let's have a close look at this receiver. Here it is. Now, this system, of course, uses the AFH. DS system, which they call it. it's the Automatic Frequency Hopping Digital System. Well, <laughs> it's quite humorous because I've yet to see a manual frequency hopping system where you have to hop the frequencies manually. So the A is kind of redundant. It's a frequency hopping system. We'll look at it on the spectrum analyzer in a minute, but let's have a look at this receiver first. Now, as I say, it's six channels, but I've got some extra ports here. And I think, oops, what have I got on there? One of the screws. Magnetic screwdriver. Wonderful. Um, yeah, these are for some other bits and pieces because this is telemetry enabled but I don't know this is a criticism I've had with a lot of so-called telemetry enabled equipment the free sky really did sort of take over the telemetry market because with the free sky you can just use a couple of resistors and you can monitor your all-important lipo voltage 
With these, you have to get another voltage sensor. You can't just plug a little board into the receiver, you know, a $2 board, and then start measuring your flight battery. Doesn't work that way. This will return the battery that goes into the receiver, the voltage that's going into your receiver, which is going to be fixed pretty much by your BEC. So there's not a lot of value in that. There's really not, unless you're running a separate flight pack and no regulator. But you think, you know, you think they could just build in that little voltage divider so you could just whack it across your LiPo. It'd be so brilliant, like FreeSky did, but nope, don't do that. However, there is a hack you can do. You can modify these receivers and use the little analog to digital converter that it currently uses to measure the input battery voltage. Use that to monitor your LiPo voltage. But it's a fiddly thing. You've got to cut traces and do soldering. Most people can't be faffed doing that. So in that respect, this loses points because it doesn't have easy telemetry for your LiPo voltage. Unless you want to spend extra money, telemetry gets spendy. It's the same with Spectrum, it's the same with uh, Futaba, it's the same with JR. All these manufacturers charge you extra for really, and quite a bit extra sometimes, for really basic things like LiPo telemetry. Free Sky, eh, it's a doddle, it's a piece of cake with the, uh, with the what is it, D-series receivers and their 280 analog inputs. Yeah, simple. Anyway, let's have a look inside this thing. Now once again, all the 2.4 goodness is behind a big metal shield here, which is actually a good idea because it stops spurious emissions and it stops the receiver picking up spurious signals. That's really quite good. Uh, it does add a bit of weight, of course, but you know, hey, so maybe they're buying off the shelf 2.4 gig modules. They're probably having them made for them. I don't know, but yeah, that, like, we can't see what 2.4 goodness is under that cover without doing a lot of work. So we're not going to bother. On the other side, of course, we've got our digital stuff. This is where it takes the signal that comes out of that RF module, turns it into the outputs that we use to drive our servos. This doesn't have S-Bus, by the way. It has something called I-Bus, which is different. Why? Why reinvent the wheel? S-Bus is available on a raft of different receivers. If it was S-Bus, it would be much nicer. You could just plug it into your regular you know, flight controllers and things. I think it does CPPM. I'm not sure. It says, yeah, it does PPM. Um, so you can use it with the PPM connection, but S-Bus just has a lower latency. It would be quite nice to keep up with the times and have S-Bus, but hey, it's a $45 radio, so we really can't grizzle too much. Now, the channel outputs go into a little daughter board there, as you can see. That's quite a common way of doing it. Yeah, nothing really to, you know, the, the quality of build is pretty good. I've got no complaints with this receiver. It looks pretty good, actually. Not too bad at all. And here's a nice touch. They even have some little grommets here to protect the antennas where they go through the case. A lot of manufacturers don't. This is a really nice touch. It's good to see some attention to detail there. So let's turn this little puppy on, see what it does. There we go. First of all, I'll raise the throttle, make sure it's got a throttle alarm. Yeah, it does. Let's bring the throttle down. There we go. Now, at this stage, the receiver's not turned on. I'm going to turn the receiver on, and we should see some telemetry information pop up on the screen. Here we go. Here you go. Look at that. And that receiver voltage is just the voltage coming into the receiver. So in this case, it is... Um, internal 6.47 because I'm running this on an LIFE pack. So there you go. Uh, the the beeper in here is actually quite quiet. I'm quite, uh, you know, it doesn't make a lot of noise. Now do these, no, there's no beep on the detent on those knobs at the top that I talked about. So you, it doesn't actually beep when you go to the mid position. Oh, that's a bit of a failing because if you've got these on flaps or something like that or, or whatever, you want to have a mid position beep so you know you're in the right place without having to look away and look down at your radio. Since this is connected, there's a rolled red bind light there, which is good. So we know it's connected up. Right, let's put the spectrum analyzer on it, see what it looks like. Okay, let's take a look. I'll turn on the transmitter and we'll see what happens. Here we go. Yep, as expected, it's using the whole band, which is great. Remember when I looked at the Radio Link AT9, it just uses a little bit of the band. This is a much better system. The, the FlySky system has... The original FlySky version 1, which I reviewed in the form of the IMAX 9X, that only had DSSS and I only used a small part of the band. But once they got to the version 2, they fixed it up and they have this full-time frequency hopping thing here. It's automatic. You don't have to tell it what frequency to use. It does it itself. Yeah. Hmm. So, yeah, as you can see, it's pretty good. If we leave that long enough, it'll probably fill the band right up. Just leave it going for a while. And voila. Now, I also have the receiver here. So... I'm thinking that maybe I'll just take the receiver away and we'll try that again because I want to see if the receiver is... The receiver may have interfered with that. Why, maybe this bike down here is the receiver sending telemetry back. So let's just try it again. Just to clear that. And I've taken the receiver further away. So we shouldn't have that problem. I don't know why that's beeping. I think it's the inactivity alarm. It is. <laughs> starts beeping straight away within a couple of minutes if you're not moving the sticks, which is a bit of a pain actually, isn't it? I mean, 
an activity should take 10 minutes or so. Maybe that's configurable, I don't know. All right, so we just leave that to build up a profile of the system's use of the band. Now that's quite interesting. We've got a couple of quite deep notches in the band there where it doesn't seem to be using any part of this band. I don't know why. Maybe the back channel for the telemetry uses those frequencies and so it's on the listen for them. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to move the transmitter away. I'm going to restart the process with the receiver sitting here. So we can see what the receiver's sitting, where it's actually broadcasting its telemetry information on the band. Okay, here we go. Now I've got the receiver right next to it and no, that seems to be hopping as well. So I don't know why we had those notches in the band. Let's have a look at the profile of the telemetry transmission. As I say, this has now got the receiver antenna right next to the spectrum analyzer. So what we're seeing is the transmission of the telemetry, telemetry information back to the transmitter. And yep, yeah, it covers the whole band as well. So yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, those notches, yeah, they're not really that important. I'd like to have seen a full band coverage, but there are just those little bits where it's not using it. It may be specific to the environment we're in. I don't know because I don't have much detail on the, what is it, the AFHDS protocol. Just to give you a comparison with the free sky, I've got my Tyrannus here, I'm going to turn that on and we'll see what, we'll see what its use of the band looks like. Whoops, close the throttle, here we go. Switch warnings, all the switches, everything is to be in the right place, here we go. So now, no, we've still got another switch, where am I? Oh, so many switches to throw. Why isn't this going? In a minute. Here we go. Now we're transmitting. Ooh, seems to be a bit more power from the Tranus. I'll give it that. And see how the Tranus is using the entire band? We actually at a much higher power level too. So it's interesting that the Free Sky has a lower power level. So I'll just move that away. And you can see the Free Sky is completely using all of the band with its frequency hopping system. There are no gaps in there. It's completely uh, filling up every piece of the band. So that's the difference. I mean, this is one of the reasons that, I know this is a review of the Fly Sky, but the Free Sky, this is one of the reasons it's so damn reliable, is it really uses the entire band. Whereas other systems, some of them, they just don't make as much use of it. The Radio Link just used that little one portion of it. And uh, the Fly Sky has a few holes where, you know, the benefit of this is that it doesn't matter how much of the band is used, you can have 90% of the band used, and that little last 10% will still get through and give you control. If you had 90% of the band used on the fly sky and the 10% happened to fall into that trough where there was no transmission, well, you're stuffed. But there you go, that's just a little simple, easy comparison for you. Now back to this. As I said, we have a telemetry display here for the receiver battery voltage and it's got it on the screen here, which is internal voltage, 6.4 volts. Um, it doesn't show an RSSI as far as I can tell, which is unfortunate because that's actually a really handy thing to have. But as I haven't read the manual, there may be more to this. I'll probably do a follow-up video because I'm going to use this. Have a fly, have a bit of a hands-on, see how it goes. But um, if I turn off the receiver, well, the telemetry information disappears, but it doesn't give us any kind of alarm. There's no beep, there's no warning, there's no RSSI low warning. It just disappears, which is a bit unfortunate because one of the things I love about telemetry is it can warn you before bad things happen. If you're flying, for example, with a mini quad nice and low between the trees and you get a bit far away and the signal level's dropping off, then you know a good system will say, hey, you know, just beep anyway to give you alert you to the fact that something isn't quite right. Doesn't seem to do it on the thing. But hey, this is a $45 radio. That is like a quarter of the price of the Tyrannus, for example. So hey, you can't grizzle too much, I suppose. Right, so there it is, the Flysky Ice or FSI6. And for 45 bucks, it looks like pretty good value for money. It's not perfect. It's got a few deficiencies, the bits that don't have as much functionality as I'd like. But hey, I'm, my frame of reference is the Tyrannus, which is, as I say, four times as much. So for 45 bucks, it's a bit of a steal. I think uh, if you get it for Banggood, it's 45 bucks, including the shipping. So that's pretty damn good. It's hard to complain about this radio. Right, if you've got any comments, questions, anything to say at all, uh, please leave them in the description of this video and I'll do my best to answer them or read them. And in the meantime, thanks for watching. Time for me to get back to the bench. Bye for now.